So I'd like to now invite uh, Sita Devi to uh, come up and uh, provide a response. I think Sita has some slides. Uh, Sita is a board member of the International Alliance of Patient Organizations. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for having me here. Um, I'm Dr. Ratna Devi, and uh, I usually do not put the doctor when I'm representing a patient organizations, but I did that purposefully here because not only I am a public health physician, but I'm also a patient. I suffer from psoriasis for the last 12 years. And I wanted to start this presentation by running a quick poll. Uh, how many of you are doctors in the audience? Just a show of hands. How many of those who are doctors have never been a patient in their life? So all of us are patients at some point of life. And it's only when we put the doctor's hat on that we forget that we can sometimes be patients as well. And I think that's the context with which I would like, like to start my presentation. Um, I would like to also thank Madam Newthert for setting the context so well on why patients could be fantastic advocates and bring the change that is so needed in, in sometimes in uh, delivering health policy and strengthening the health systems. So my topic for today is how patient associations are contributing to health and prosperity. And I'm representing the International Alliance of Patient Organizations, which is an umbrella body based out of the UK. It's a charity, and it is made up of members who are also patient organizations. So IAPO, or the International Alliance of Patient Organizations, was established uh, in Netherlands as a charity in the year 1999. We finished 20 years this year. Next year, we will be coming of age, which is 21 years, and we plan to have a global patient congress in Edinburgh to commemorate the coming of age at uh, year 21. So that is our membership. Uh, we have 268 member organizations. Some of these member organizations are national alliances with uh, many, many local patient organizations that represent the various uh, disease spectrums. We are represented in 71 countries, and uh, we also represent 52 disease areas. Again, some of these disease areas are uh, a large spectrum. For example, uh, the non-communicable disease areas would have many uh, diseases under it. The rare disease Diseases group would have many diseases under it, and that's how we are represented by the cross-disease uh, representation of various patient groups. Our vision and mission uh, is to see the patients are at the center of healthcare, and now the dialogue is moving from patients to people-centered healthcare. And like I said, um, you know, if you see, then no person ever is not a patient in their uh, span of life, and therefore it has to be population and people that are taken uh, into consideration when you are designing health fa health um, facilities as well as healthcare delivery, and the popular uh, tagline that most patient organizations use is uh, nothing about us without us. That means we should be there right from the beginning before it goes to the drawing board to the end when there is an analysis of where the gaps are and how we can co-deliver. The mission is to build patient-centered healthcare worldwide. Uh, this is a dream. Uh, I don't know how soon we will be able to achieve it, but we are working towards that. So we have three pillars of strategy. The first one is to empower patient communities globally to advocate effectively for patient-centered universal health care for all. And we do this by developing toolkits uh, so that people are able to understand. Many patients start with um, an independent story, and uh, they are very passionate about the uh, disease area that they represent, but sometimes they do not have the ability to understand the technical language or the policy language or the political environment, and therefore we develop the toolkits to be able to empower them to speak the language that policymakers or uh, other technical people can understand. Uh, we also work to drive research processes and development of uh, evidence base for patient-centered universal health care. And uh, the research process could be, uh, you know, people-centered research or behavioral research that happens at the grassroots level and what uh, patient preferences are, to uh, driving the uh, drug development processes or clinical trials. And we try and see that the patient voice is uh, represented at every level. This is not easy because um, the context in every geographical region is very, very different. So while we have patient representation very strongly in the development 
developed countries like the Europe or America. It was not that well represented in Asia, Africa, and now it's getting stronger in Latin America. Uh, we also shape policy and practice in uh, patient-centered universal healthcare globally, regionally, and at national levels. We are in an official relationship with the World Health Organization and are invited to all their strategic meetings, including the World Health Assembly and the UN high-level meetings. We are also an, uh, having an EcoStock status, which is the Economic Social uh, Council status. We get a special seat at the table at most of the strategic discussions that we have. So this is a small map where I tried to show the state of peace in the world. And if you see the state fragility index 2017, which is a wide spectrum of indicators, including the economic status, the state of uh, armed conflict, the state of natural disasters and all, it seems that pretty much the entire world is in, uh, not very peaceful and is very, very fragile. Towards your uh, right is the Global Peace Index, um, which shows that in most of the parts of the world, um, you know, there is a very low level of peace. And if there is no peace, then that uh, drives many of the factors that lead to low level of health as well, including mental health, which is now being talked about globally, and how mental health and environment lead to a lot of diseases across the globe. And therefore, and the fragility index is inversely proportional to the global peace. So the more fragile a state is, the lower the level of peace. And if that is the situation of the world, then uh, we can understand what the uh, situation of patients would be. And in most of these countries where uh, the fragility is very high, um, the uh, availability of healthcare is also very low. And therefore, it becomes an even more compounding factor because pe where people need healthcare the most, it is the least available. So uh, the conclusion is that conflict is permanent and global, and 16 million people in uh, every year are displaced as well as the UNHCR report. These people are constantly on the move or migrating or escaping conflict, and when they are doing that, because they are constantly on the move, they are very vulnerable, they don't have facilities where they can go to, and it is important that we talk about these people when we talk about healthcare delivery. So the question is, will status quo work? Will, will the traditional way of healthcare delivery from facilities work? So um, I believe that doctors and paramedical staff may also be scarce and displaced in conflict situations. Um, they also may have a threat to lives, as we see from reports from organizations that uh, work in conflict zones like the International Red Cross or uh, MSF. And infrastructure is also destroyed or unavailable. There is low stocks and supply chain is always disrupted. There is severe emotional and psychological trauma not addressed by traditional services. And um, like Madam said, for many of the non-communicable diseases, you do not need a hospital for treatment. So if, for example, if you are a diabetes, uh, diabetic on insulin, you really don't need to go to a hospital. All you need is your supply chain to be maintained and you can still manage your diabetes. But for people who are constantly on the move or who are in areas where uh, supply chains are disrupted, the medication is not available and therefore they are not able to manage their uh, condition. So we come to the concept of expert patients. A civil society and patient groups come to the rescue under such extreme conditions, and this has been proven time and again where patients who are experts in their own condition can actually help other people in the community manage the condition better. There is a need for developing expert patients and communities to manage emergencies. So we talk of hospitals, we talk of uh, other facilities being managed, but we do not talk of expert patients uh, contributing to crisis situations. Uh, there are special needs like young children, women, aged and chronic diseases where probably the people, the community and expert patients can contribute faster and sooner and much better before the uh, other uh, you know, professional services can come into areas of conflict. If healthcare is to be co-designed and co-produced, then including patients and at every step is a must, including uh, conflict management. 
So uh, some of the recommendations that we've been making to various bodies at every World Health Assembly, we have endorsed WHO Director General's response to severe large scale responses saying patients should be part of those responses. To attain the SDG 2030, there has to be a more concrete global international law policy and institutional standards framework for the achievement of SDGs with the involvement of patient bodies. There is a book called the Sphere uh, Handbook, which actually describes how to manage humani humanitarian crisis and what patient rights should be protected. It's like the Holy Grail and it has many member organizations that have actually co-designed it. Expert refugee patients um, need to be a consultative body to the UN Security Council. We recommended to the WHA the establishment of a medicines buffer stock in conflict zones to support major healthcare emergencies. And one suggestion to the professionals, maybe refugee medicine is a new speciality that we need to look at. My time is up, so thank you so much. We are having our Global Patient Congress in Edinburgh in uh, 2020, and I invite everyone's participation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Devi. And, uh, and now I'd like to ask our second responder, um, Professor Federico Lega, to come and uh, give us some words. Uh, Federico is Director of Research and of the Research and Training Center in Health Administration in Milan. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> I'm not going to use slides, but just have a few comments. Uh, rather than responses, uh, uh, a focus on, uh, there was on how digitalization actually can improve patient voice and uh, patient association voice in, uh, in modern times. Now, we have two different settings here, the, the peace and the crisis time. I will focus more on peace because that's actually where digitalization is obviously uh, working uh, more, but I will also make some comments about uh, could, what we, could we do in, in crisis time. Um, my starting point is the fact that we have uh, activated patients and activated uh, patient association in modern times. You, you are, uh, all are aware of the fact that we have a lot of opportunities to uh, get more uh, involved and engaged in, in uh, our healthcare and in the way we um, manage the relationship with health organization and physicians. Now, uh, from that perspective, we also move from the idea or the notion of patient involvement to patient engagement because what we expect is the fact that uh, most uh, health organization, uh, whether they work in a most health system, whether they work in, in crisis or peacetime, they will uh, announce uh, co-production uh, activity or co-production paradigms uh, with patients, which means we, we uh, have a complete new shift in the way we, we expect health organization physician to the, relate uh, with patients. Um, we, we all are basically uh, on, on this respect nurtured by the fact that uh, the way we, we interact with the industry, with the business, with the, uh, in, in our social life regularly, we, we uh, are consumer activated and we want to do the same when we come to, to manage our healthcare problems. So if, if this is uh, uh, true, we, we do have uh, the knowledge, the skills, in many cases we have the knowledge, the skills, the technology to become uh, potentially a plus for the, the healthcare system, providing uh, uh, part of the delivery of the, system, of the service itself, providing opportunities to announce and bring uh, the delivery of healthcare to the next level. Uh, at the same time, many health organizations, many health systems are not focusing really much on this. They just leave in the markets to regulate uh, what's going on, or leaving the single organization, the single uh, hospitals to decide what to do. There's not really much uh, sort of an umbrella vision about how can we uh, maximize uh, the uh, outcomes of the digitalization era, and how can we use this both in, in peace time or in crisis time. I'm going to uh, just uh, underline a few things, actually, I want you to reflect. And, and because I'm talking about, about digitalization, I remind all of you that you can uh, ask questions through the digital system that we have uh, here at the conference. So please uh, do that. So we're going to have a, a fruitful conversation after uh, our presentation. Now, 
these are the, the, the points I want to underline. Uh, digitalization can, can do a lot if it's well regulated. I come to the point of uh, what, what do I mean by well regulated uh, uh, at the end of my presentation. But can do a lot if you look at it from this perspective. First of all, it could be a great opportunity to increase health literacy. It was already mentioned by, by uh, my, my pre predecessors. Uh, because we can uh, provide patients uh, with a lot of uh, uh, um, regulated information uh, that re uh, regards their pathology or their risk factors. We have a large, really a large opportunity or a huge opportunity to uh, announce in all health ca countries, in all health systems, uh, the, the health literacy through the use of dig digital uh, tools, especially to the fact that we can communicate easily with patients through mobile phone or any other, any other apps. This will uh, uh, create two uh, important changes. One is we are moving or we can move the system from uh, the, the traditional paradigm of compliance in which we expect patients to do what the doctors or the health professional will tell them to do, to what we call today concordance. We expect a lot, and oncology has been one of the driving force in this respect. We expect today health organization, physician, health system to provide to the patients the right information to take decisions together about what should be done. That's, that's completely new in the sense that we've been discussing this for a few years, but when, when, I, when I look at, at how physicians, how health system, and how health organization are still uh, uh, looking at the relationship between them and the patients, they're still very much in the compliance paradigm rather than moving to the concordance. It's still very much left to the single individual, to the single physicians, to the single organization to take these decisions. It's not a system perspective, it's not a system move. And I, and I really press everyone to think about this, okay? Because that, that, that's actually where we create frustration on one side and then we, we don't actually uh, um, really uh, I want to say, generate uh, all the power, all the possibilities that we have through digitalization. At the same time, it was mentioned before, uh, same things could be done in crisis time when we identify uh, expert patients and use expert patients to produce health literacy, at least the minimum that is required to manage a population in a crisis time, to provide the basic, the basic information that can help whoever actually is delivering health in that specific context so that the population will, will have uh, access to those information that could actually improve the chance that we're going to do the max, maximum uh, uh, that is possible. Second thing that we, 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 we have uh, uh, in the agenda is the fact that uh, digitalization can also help us to move the system from reactive to proactive, from management patients to management citizens, population with risk factors. That's actually where all systems are struggling to move on. Uh, that's where we want to go, because if we start managing risk factors, which means through digitalization, we make people more accountable for health lifestyles, and that's actually what we should look for in terms of uh, um, policy, then we will have a better chance that we can make systems sustainable and, and uh, rather say, contain the escalation of, uh, of uh, uh, health issues. Now, that, that's, that's, that's tricky, obviously, because it means actually you have to uh, uh, generate uh, an alliance between the system and the patients, that the patients will be willing actually to give data about whatever they do, even if they go running in the morning, whether they have a, a gym, whether they, they, they do a whatever, yoga. Uh, it, it's a lot of information that we need to put together, and, and doctors, whoever actually become the case manager, or the patients, rather say, or the, the citizen, rather say, uh, health uh, uh, ally, should be able to monitor that and make sure that actually, whatever necessary, intervene proactively rather than reactively. So we, we, we need to shift in that, in that direction. And digitalization helps us to do a different level of engagement when it comes to rela relating uh, um, the system with the population. A third major point that I see uh, uh, is about monitor compliance or increased adherence. This is, uh, uh, is enough. I mean, everyone knows about the fact that we can use digital uh, tools to increase the chance that we, we uh, can monitor whether a patient is following or not a certain clinical pathway, whether it is, is uh, uh, um, uh, 
compliant or not to a, a definite protocol or to certain uh, uh, expectations that the, the, the health system or the health organization, the hospital, or the, the uh, single physician is asking him or her to do. Uh, yet, uh, there is a lot to do here, and uh, uh, if we do so, uh, we have a certainly uh, the chance that we move from just what we call co-production to co-creation of services with the patients. If we put together concordance and the fact that we can use the, the, the uh, digital uh, uh, applications to monitor adherence or rather what the patients do and then interact with the physicians, we're moving to a next level, which means really co-creation. And then could be also uh, a situation which exception, specific situation uh, uh, request demand can be managed through the digitalization, through the digital hubs between the health system, the health organization, again, the physicians and the patients. Uh, when we come to co-creation, then that's really what I mean by uh, empowering and activating patients. Because I'm not saying that actually a patient should be free to do whatever he wants, but the least should be able to ask uh, when it, whenever it's necessary. What I'm going to do is because I have a weekends, I want to go there, I'm going to manage my therapy during the weekends or during my vacation, so things like that. Okay, which, which really make life easier and enhance the patient experience and enhance the possibility that there's really a good alliance between the, 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 the health provider and the patient itself. Then we have uh, an increase in access because digitalization is writing a new page in remote medicine. Uh, we've been investing a lot in this idea of having screen and having a connection, and now everyone is sending WhatsApp, image, uh, text, emails, whatever. So everything has changed. So we need to get serious about this because we, we cannot leave single physicians to bear the, the, the burden of deciding what to do with this because otherwise it's going to be a mess. <laughs> It's going to be really complicated, and we're going to have a lot of diversity and variability within the system, and, and it's not actually what we want. We want to provide patients the same level of experience, the same access to the, the quality, uh, quality uh, uh, provision of health care. So health literacy, health literacy concordance, uh, a shift towards co-creation, uh, the, the notion of uh, uh, remote medicine in new ways, uh, uh, new uh, opportunities to create other ends and so on. So there's a lot going on and also in crisis time there's a lot of opportunities to announce through digitalization at least uh, provide the opportunity for, for uh, uh, generating that basic, basic health literacy that uh, could also, as I said before, could announce uh, a good relationship with the population and whoever actually is trying to provide health services in that specific context. My last point, which is the question, is uh, the big issue. Um, we already know that whoever is going to have the control over the data and the information, uh, data from the citizen or for the patients, and information, uh, scientific information or, or uh, health information, will have a, a lot of influential power on everyone. Um, Google, Amazon can estimate and predict whether we are separating, divorcing for our wife or husband, just looking at what we buy and what movements we do. So on a, on a daily basis, they're able to predict most of our behaviors, just using few data that we regularly put in the, in the, uh, uh, in the web. So think about what happens when we're going to have uh, lots of data. Obviously, if I can see it from a perspective of the single hospital, uh, 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 piling up this data and using those data to provide services, to announce services, to announce the experience is certainly good things. But if I look at from a systems perspective, my question is, should we regulate this? Should we have someone like an authority providing an umbrella strategy or vision for all the providers, public and private, and try to put in the health system one single, one single unitary strategy about how do we manage? This. How will we, what we mean by patient engagement and how can we use the digital tools and all the new technology in order to move in the same direction and provide to the population same opportunities uh, uh, in, in terms of its utilization. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Federico. Um, it's a measure of the uh, importance of this topic uh, and also of the responsiveness of the Omani health system that uh, we have the Under Secretary, Dr. Ali Al Hani, with us today. Thank you very much for uh, coming and listening. Uh, 
uh, it, it's the easiest thing to, uh, for ministries to support a conference, but uh, to, to really get the value and, and uh, participate, then uh, we really thank you. And it can be challenging to hear what patients have got to say. I remember a couple of years ago, uh, I was uh, the director of medical services at a mid medium-sized coastal hospital, and the head of surgery came in to talk to me, and he said, oh, Paul, I've got a problem. I said, what's the problem? And I'm used to dealing with problems all day in, in medical administration. He said, I've got a problem with Facebook. And I thought, whoa, this could be bad. I said, what's the problem? And he said, I did my ward round, and uh, I saw a patient that came in last night. The registrar presented the patient to me, had a very sore belly, and I said, I think it's inflammation. And, uh, I said, yes, so what's the Facebook angle? He said, well, the next thing, people were showing me pictures of me telling the patient that it was inflammation, and the patient had posted my ward round on Facebook and said, doctor thinks it's inflammation, what do you think? <laughs> uh, he said, I, you know, I'm used to having discussion from my students, perhaps occasional questions from my patients, but from the whole community, this is new. <laughs> but the world is not going backwards, and uh, we have to be up for that conversation. And in fact, our speakers have to face it because now it's your turn to ask questions. And uh, I think you have this Slido app. Who has the Slido app going? Oh, that's bad. <laughs> so look in, in the Facebook app and uh, send some questions in. So we have, we have one question uh, to Dr. Sita. Selecting voices that are considered representative is quite problematic. I told you it could be confronting. Yeah. You know, instead of asking questions that you can use the microphone to settle everybody down, they're saying, who are you and why are you representative? You know, of all the seven billion, eight billion people on the planet, who gets to be a representative? Especially to the policy makers that you have access to. And what approach and what tools do you recommend? Thank you for that question. And yes, um, it is a question that confounds a lot of people, including the patient organizations. Uh, but like they say, uh, what is not seen and what is not heard is not represented. So which is why, you know, one of our strategic goals is to empower patients to raise their voices at the right platforms. So uh, to answer the question of what tools do you recommend, um, you know, uh, the tools that really work are being social media savvy, learning how to address public uh, you know, gatherings and platforms like this, looking for opportunities where you can comment. So uh, these days there are a lot of online discussions that happen even from the governments where you know, public opinions are asked for. So if you are a patient representative or a patient organization and you put in your voice there, then the government recognizes you and uh, may ask you next time to be part of the uh, discussion upfront. Or if there's a technical group meeting or something happening and you have already registered, then the likelihood that the, the patient who is registered uh, is invited to that is higher than just being a patient organization out there because there are zillions of patient organizations and it's, it's very hard to know which one is the right one because everyone has a point of view and everyone has something to say. Federico, perhaps I could ask you to respond. You talked about co-production and about a shift to co-creation of health policy and of regulation. Does it really matter which patient organisations you talk to? Is it, uh, you know, is it just a matter of starting the conversation or does the quality of that conversation and who people are representing matter? Thank you for the question. This is a very good question because it goes to back to the point that we should distinguish 
uh, wants and needs in the sense that uh, what we're trying to do in a health system is usually translate the wants of the patients into needs that the, the system make institutionalized and decided to offer as the, as the minimum, rather say, set of health uh, package or rather say uh, health service delivery that is necessary for that population. So it's a tricky question in the sense that certainly we need to have uh, channels through which patients should, should make uh, 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 clear to the system or to the single organization what they want, so what expectation they put. But on the other times, we, on the other side, we need to have the same channel through which health system, uh, uh, health organization are able to communicate with patients, try to uh, rather say, you are just realign uh, expectations between wants and needs. So things actually are worth actually to be uh, included within the system or not. Um, obviously, there, there's, a, there's a lot of difference where we're talking about pure private providers uh, working a lot on, on wants and, and, and trying to meet expectation of patients at higher level because they're willing to uh, pay out-of-pocket money for that, or whether it be reimbursed from public system trying to do uh, a different thing. So I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, uh, judging one or the other. I'm just saying there might be the different channels in, in the two situation. What we need to, to uh, uh, understand is that whoever actually is managing a, a system or rather uh, organization need at this stage to provide uh, a clear channel through which patient, not Facebook obviously, <laughs> a clear channel through which patients can can provide their faith as quickly respond and try to enhance health literacy through that responses. So that we need to have institutional mechanisms, but quick response, quickly, like like, uh, like treating at that time patients or, or potentially patients or customers. If I send a message and I don't get an answer, I get a, a formal answer, so that doesn't work. So it, it's a lot of investment that needs to be done in order to, to understand what really patient wants. But on the other side, and I'm closing my response, I think is a, it's a, a mandatory, compulsory for health system health organization also to try to realign once to really what is actually appropriate in healthcare and what actually uh, should be delivered according to scientific, uh, let's say, evidence and so on, which is often far away from what patients get from media and sometimes I'd rather say from patient association, which actually uh, are very strong in advocating not just uh, what is strictly necessary, but uh, uh, even more than that. So I think it's a, an answer of can digital technologies speed up the whole cycle of, of uh, responding and production. Uh, Uther, I think the next question is for you. How do you know what a patient really wants? It's from Dr. Raymond Camps, but I don't mm -hmm. think he's asking the patients, in the, the doctors in the room, I think he's asking <laughs> you. I think most of the time the patients are the ones who know what they want the doctor providing the service. But the doctors normally don't go to the patients and tell the patient you're sick, or you have this, or you have that. They go to the doctor, and they're the ones who tell the doctor what the problem is. So most of the time, the patient know what they want, but do they receive it from the doctors? This is the question you should ask. Most of the time, they don't. So they start seeking, they start asking so many questions, going to another doctor, sec second opinion, whatever. So really, most of the time, the, doc the patients do know what they want, and it is up to the doctors to provide the answers. Thank you. Um, OK, we've got some more uh, questions there. This is a good one. Um, being an advocate for the patient in times of peace uh, was well explained. Can we elaborate on the role of advocacy in the time of war? Now, uh, just before the talk, I was talking with, with our panellists and the question was, does uh, patient voice, patient advocacy have a place in crisis? Or is it a luxury of peacetime? Uh, so uh, that's, a, that's an important question. Uh, any, of, any of you like to respond? Um, as I said before, and from the slides that I showed on the state of uh, fragility and the state of uh, peace, I think most of the world is not really peaceful. So, um, you know, a patient voice has a value and relevance uh, at any point of time, whether it is uh, extremely conflicting situation or not so peaceful situation. Having said that, uh, if it is really a disrupted system, 
I think it's the community and the patient that actually comes to deliver the healthcare services at the first instant. Because if, if whether you see a natural disaster like a cyclone or, or uh, an armed conflict, uh, the hospitals, the doctors are not available at the point where the actual conflict is happening in remote villages and places like that. And there it is just the family or the, or the physicians uh, or the nurses or uh, paramedical staff who are the ones who actually come to the rescue at the first instance. And therefore it's important that those voices are given a place. There's not much happening uh, around advocacy for that voice, um, except that civil society is present, but the patient voice in that is very underrepresented. And I th think we need to work a little more around that. Federica, what are you, sir? Uh, I think she's more competent. <laughs> <laughs> not really. I think we need to prepare everyone in times of peace so that when we do have the crisis, everybody is already prepared. We shouldn't wait until crisis to expect people to be prepared and to act on it. So really, the, advo the advocates should be working throughout to encourage the, 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 the public. And they're there because, as, as I think Anita said, that uh, the doctors are in the hospitals. They are on the ground and at least they can get to the people faster. They don't have to go to go protocols, they don't have to ring so and so. So it is very, very important in times of crisis. Advocacy is very important, it should be encouraged. And I think we should have them on the table when we are di discussing crisis so that they are given the power to help the patient during crisis. Yes. I can just add one quick thing. So in, in time of crisis, one of the, the questions that we have is that a lot of associations are trying to help and, and, and provide uh, services. But uh, the major point that I always see from my perspective is the fact there's a lack of coordination integration among the association itself. So patient advocacy, I think, should go in the direction of making sure that whoever actually is running the institutions uh, uh, make sure that the, there's a lot of coordination uh, so that we uh, avoid redundancy and competitions among associations that sometimes happen uh, uh, in, in crisis time, and that's a waste of money, it's a waste of time, waste of resources, and, and I saw many times actually that happen. Yes, I think um, in one of the uh, common definitions of a disaster from a healthcare service perspective is it's a disaster when the normal uh, responses of the organisation have been overwhelmed, and precisely at that time Healthcare organisations often have to ask the community for help. Uh, in in uh, my own town in Canberra, um, uh, 15 years ago or so, we had bushfires. We had uh, 500 houses burnt to the ground, and we had um, several thousand people displaced from their homes. And we brought them into community centres. Within three days, we only had about 15 people left in the in the disaster centre, the community had taken them in. And uh, we also had an overwhelming response of community members volunteering to assist, uh, whether that was looking after people or nurses or pharmacists or doctors offering to help and staff the place. But it's in that time of crisis that the community will often be the biggest source of support rather than demands for the health system. And if we are open to that dialogue, we can make our health system function in times of crisis where otherwise we would be struggling. Uh, Frederica, you're in the hot seat. Um, nowadays, most of the patients Google the medicine they receive from doctors for side effects. How can we avoid such issues in the digital world? I wish I bet, I bet Google wants to know the answer to that question. I guess, too. I guess, I guess we just can't avoid it. But uh, uh, going back also to the previous question, I think what I what I expect to happen is that uh, physicians. Now you know the, 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 there's been this movement of evidence-based medicine. Everything should be actually uh, provided on a scientific basis. Fine, but. Uh, the more patients become activated and expert, the more they expect, I believe, and that's actually what we're trying to experiment also in my country, the fact that physicians have to provide to the patients the basis, the foundation for their decision, which, which means I want the scientific papers that you are using to provide me the evidence. When, I, when I'm in front of you and I have a, a serious pathology and you, offer me, you have to offer me the portfolio 
of alternatives, and I want also to see the grounds of the portfolio. So, because I, I can read a, a scientific uh, uh, paper, I want the scientific paper. Maybe I can't read the scientific paper, give me at least the synopsis or something that I can understand, or the reference. That's, that's where we have to move, probably. Be more, rather say, transparent in the way we, we, we uh, deliver care. If patients get explanations, they get what they want, and we're going to be easier to manage the, the gap between uh, wants and needs, or rather say wants and what the, the, the system thinks actually you'd be worth it to receive. Yes, I, th I think um, Dr. Google has the same problem that many of us have in practice, and that is Dr. Google is only as good as the questions that his patients ask. Uh, what's next? Um, to the patient representatives, to what extent are you comfortable with your data being used for research? It depends on who is using it and um, in what context it's being used. And if it is a transparent method, then uh, we would love to share the data because if that leads to new treatments uh, with lesser side effects and lesser complications, then it's better for the patient. Yutha, do you have any, any comments on this? I um, uh, imagine that with uh, several different cancers under treatment, you may have been invited to participate in some research. Yes, uh, I wasn't unfortunately invited, but uh, I was interested to see, and I did look around in the net to see the different researches, the options I have. But uh, I think most patients would con consent to having their data to be used for research because it's going to help others. And if you're a type of person like me who is uh, very passionate about helping others, it is natural that if I'm asked, I would volunteer to get my data used for research. It would be good if we could do more research on peace. You know, I think if the... <laughs> If the, um, the question of our times is how do we stop the conflicts and keep looking after each other, uh, we should have more, more research on that. Perhaps it will come from our audience as they go back to their universities. Federico. Can I make just a, a quick note on this? Um, one of the um, things that we're working on is, is there any possibility that we uh, create a sort of an open access system on data of patients, uh, provided that we define a subset of data which will be available to all researchers uh, across a, a system? So I'm not saying again, giving uh, very sensitive information, but if, if we do uh, follow up, control, uh, outpatient visit, whatever, uh, and we decided that certain uh, data, they could be uh, blood tests rather than uh, uh, X-ray, rather than imaging, whatever. So we define. Uh, uh, not sensitive uh, information that could be available to all researchers. They can t take a court of patients and see what happened to the court of patients. So, so there will be uh, uh, a lot of, uh, rather say, um, quite a big opportunity for the system itself. So we're working on that, whether there's any possibility that, that we, uh, we have an NHS system, so the NHS actually will actually force, to some extent, that policy into the system, but making available uh, as, as much as possible uh, certain data. Obviously, when it's a clinical trial, uh, and new innovative medicine, these are different things. But, but I think we, we, we need to generate a culture of research uh, across the system, across all physicians. All physicians should be involved some, uh, so, sooner or later in some research. If they don't do the research, they will probably uh, not develop as they could. Okay. Uh, it sounds really ever onward and upward with uh, co-production, co-creation, research and things. So I might just turn to the theme of conflict within our, our systems. So can it happen that the objectives of the patient associations differ from those of the patients? And um, also uh, there was another question there. Oh yes, why are many clinicians reluctant to incorporate the opinions of their patients regarding the best approach to their care. So, I mean, this is coming at the, the conflict between patients and, and their carers. Um, it's a common experience. What do, we, what do we say about it? What does our panel have to say? Um, the first I'll, question is basing I, you. Yeah, I'll try to answer the first. <laughs> 
Um, the, the answer to the first question is yes and no, um, and it depends on how evolved the patient is or how evolved the patient organization is. And like I said, very often uh, the patients start with their own personal stories and what they did not get or what they perceive as gaps or what, what kind of difficulties they had in accessing the healthcare system and which is the reason why you know most often they become advocates and start uh, looking for answers but once many such patients come together under one umbrella um, most often their interests are beyond just the needs of one patient so it goes beyond just how do I get my medicines or how do I get my diagnostics to how can I get my country to register a new medicine or how can we um, you know, contribute to a new research for maybe a newer medicine or a newer diagnostics. So it is yes and no because uh, when you become more involved and more stronger as an advocacy organization, you look at a larger picture and patients sometimes look at personal needs and uh, you know, individual gaps that they want addressed. Yutha, the um, Cancer Association, I, I find it hard to imagine there would be many doctors in Oman that would disagree with you. Yes. Uh, <laughs> why? But does it happen? <laughs> I give them a hard time. And we at the, at the Oman Cancer Association, we work for the patients and we listen to the patient. And I'm the patient myself, so I can sympathize. And I think, as you said, that most of the advocates are patients themselves, so they can sympathize with the patients. And it is, it's difficult, it's very rare that the associations, there are times when it's personal that the patient has a conflict with the associations, but most of the time, especially we at the Oman Cancer Association, we are there for the patients. So really, most of the time, we try our level best to see what the patient's needs are, and we tend to agree with each other and try to help each other. Uh, just a quick comment, because again, patient association could be a linkage between system and, and single patient, right? So now it's a difficult position, whatever you're in the middle, because you, you have to incorporate on one side expectation for the single individuals, but also if you want to contribute to the system, you have also to, um, in a certain way, um, support strategy of the system itself because you know something is sustainable, something is not sustainable, something it's, it's in the focus of the policy, something is not in focus. And on the other side, uh, clarify uh, and, and uh, explain why certain decisions are taken by the system to individuals. So it's, it's really vital that we, we make uh, a good governance system between system, patient association, uh, because if we don't have good alliance and good governance, it's going to be trouble. Uh, it's going to be trouble for the system, and we waste uh, a, a big opportunity also to communicate uh, in a most, or rather say, transparent and trust way between the system, physicians, and, and individuals. You were asking me whether no, I, the doctors, I think most of the doctors are here in the audience, some of the doctors are here in the audience, and they just have to see my face, I think, in the oncology department, and they say, here she comes. But the patients will come to us to mediate between themselves and the doctors. And I don't know why some doctors are intimidated by that, to see the association being involved. You're not doctors, what you're doing here. But really, the patients themselves, they don't have that ability to, to ask the questions or they're too emotional to ask the question. So they tend to need us to communicate with the doctors. It is difficult when it comes to association working with the patients and mediating with the doctors. Uh, from my experience of leading an alliance, it is even more complicated uh, because, you know, every um, vertical disease area which is represented by a patient group thinks that their disease is the most important and needs the highest attention. And uh, sometimes it is very difficult. For example, when we work with rare diseases, then very few are treatable. But then the patient groups are there across all the uh, disease spectrums. And it is very frustrating for those patient groups who do not have treatments. Uh, and they expect that we will spend our energy and resources in advocating with the government to get those treatments or to invest in research. While the government thinks that uh, let us first get the treatment to the people who are already there and where the treatment is available. 
So whether you put your investments into new research or into buying the medicines for existing people where there is a treatment. And there the patients sometimes think that the leaders are not aligning with their needs. So those situations do exist. Yes, I think um, uh, we know that uh, doctors can be great advocates, but they're best known as being advocates for their diseases. Yes. yes. Can I just a very quick comment. So again, when, when, I see there's a, when you see an increase in conflicts between patients and doctors, from our perspective, I thought the management perspective, it's because we have a failure of the system from two, in two ways. First of all, you, you might have weak doctors, not strong enough, from, from not competent enough uh, uh, to uh, face a confrontation with, with activated patients. So that means actually the system is not providing enough opportunity to develop their profession enough. On the other side, you put the doctors at stake because the system is, because of economic viability, because of sustainability, because one of the reasons, is forcing the doctors uh, to, to uh, make a decision which not necessarily are uh, the, the first best, and they're, they're, they're the one actually <laughs> having to uh, uh, re respond to patients. So in both situations, systems should actually go back and, and, and rewind and say, what, what we're doing, uh, okay? Uh, because if the doctor is strong, is strong uh, and I have an oncology patient not responding to the third cycle, I should be able to, to explain why I'm going to you know, keep them off from the, from the innovative uh, therapy, whatever. Uh, a different thing is, is I'm not even making access to the innovative therapy because there's another, so, uh, there's another story behind. So in both situations, the system actually should, should actually provide their physicians, their doctors, their clinicians uh, uh, good training also on communication skills, uh, obviously on, on uh, professional competence, and then prepare them to manage the increased number of this situation that we're going to see in the future. And just a comment. Nowadays, patients are very, very informed, not like 30, 40 years ago. So I think uh, the doctors uh, need to be prepared. Yes, uh, which might bring us to the, the middle question there. Should we train health staff on how to engage patients? Um, uh, as I said, I work in a medical administration and uh, every day problems from the institution walk through the door. Uh, a couple of months ago I had the, um, the digital team come in and they say, oh, we have a problem with WhatsApp. I said, oh, I've got that. I know what WhatsApp is, I didn't really, I'm not much of a WhatsApp user, but they said WhatsApp has taken off amongst the junior doctors. They're all communicating about their patients, about their patient lists, doing their handovers using WhatsApp. And I said, huh, are they supposed to be? And they said, well, no. I said, well, what are we going to do about it? And they said, well, we've considered asking you to ban use of WhatsApp for patient care. And I said, oh, have you? They said, but we thought we'd better not because it would be too dangerous. I said, what do you mean? I said, well, if they didn't use WhatsApp, they just wouldn't be able to look after their patients anymore. It's, uh, it's become so integral to their work. So we put out some policies about using WhatsApp in uh, Canberra Hospital and told them that, you know, they still had to comply with um, patient privacy, with data handling. If they made notes in WhatsApp and passed them on to another doctor, they had to put those notes into the patient record. Some of those basics of uh, communication. And now we're starting to think, should we give the patients their number? Should they be able to get patients into their WhatsApp network? Um, maybe that's a, um, a bridge too far, but uh, how do you think we can incorporate social media as a way for patients to access their care teams and communicate with them? Do you see that happening as yet? I would love to see it happening, but unfortunately it might be abused because the doctors as it is, they're already you know, occupied with so many patients, they're busy, they don't want to be getting WhatsApp every five minutes from patients asking them unnecessary questions which they could wait and the next day, for instance, to get an answer. So we have to be a little bit careful about including in the WhatsApp group of the doctors, the patients themselves. 
Six, I, th I see another question here. Would you, w should we train health staff on how to engage with patients? Definitely we should. But do they have the time? You have nurses having to look after 30, 40 patients. What time do they have to sit and engage with the patients? I, I believe that we should employ counselors so that we can uh, engage the patients, so they can find out what the patients need out. So when they have the normal doctors, nurses meeting, weekly meetings, or they, whatever, they can part that information to the nurses. But definitely, we need to engage the, the nurses to engage with the patients. OK, look, we're on our last few questions. So bring them in, and I'm sure we can um, talk after the session, if your question hasn't been answered, come up and um, we'll have a private discussion. But uh, the last couple of questions. Um, should there be representatives of patients in the administration of the hospitals? Um, how? Sita. The answer to that is a definite yes. yes. And many hospitals do have that uh, as a part of their system um, by getting patients to be representative when they have their uh, administrative meetings. But I think it should be more formalized. Um, and in uh, many hospitals, um, especially in, um, in uh, disease areas like, say, HIV or cancer, they do have peer, peer counselors or expert patients who sit in the OPD or the IPD and handhold the patient through the journey, uh, especially when the initial diagnosis is made and they are in a state of shock. So th there, are, there are such systems existing in many places around the world, but it may not be a formal system. So we, maybe we need to convert it into something more formal so that hospitals take it as a best practice. So, Federico, you are a professor of uh, health administration and you do research. Can we, is this a topic for us to research? It, it, it is a topic. The topic of how we build the governance of hospitals, obviously, has been uh, there in the agenda for the last 50, 60, 70 years. Um, two quick comments. One is, uh, more than representative of patients, I would rather say representative of communities, because if you talk about patients, every patient, every pathology will to be represented, so it's going to be very difficult, and then you have much more powerful association rather than another, and so on. So I say, yes, we should have some non-executive representative uh, of, of community sitting on the board, or, or at least having regular routine through which uh, the administration of hospital is accountable to them um, in terms of strategic decisions, uh, development new services, so there must be uh, some, some kind of uh, liaison. Um, if I can just say one thing about the, the, the previous uh, question, which is interesting, uh, should we train doctors in how to engage patients? I think we should ad start to adopting much more seriously into health care some of the concepts that come from the industry when we, come, we, we uh, talk about business modeling, uh, delivering a service into an ambulatory with the uh, orthopedic surgeons rather than the cardiologists receiving a patient for a uh, follow-up visit, for a first visit, for a specific uh, diagnosis need to be business model exactly as we uh, do the same in, in, in the other industry. How do we uh, uh, make the uh, patient access the services? What we uh, tell them in the first minute? How, how is managed the waiting? What happened after? So we, we start to look at from that lenses also in healthcare because that is going to enhance a lot the experience of the patients and the engagement is not going to be any more a problem. Yes, it's really, in, in other industries, engagement with your clients is seen as one of the biggest sources of generating value. And so we've had um, the opportunity to hear that today. Yutha, I might ask you to take the last word. You have, hands up, how many people are doctors or run hospitals? Do you have some final words to tell them? <laughs> Please listen to the patient. Listen, listen to the patient. Don't concentrate on your computer and looking at results, whatever. Give the patient some time. It is very important. Okay, well look, um, I'd like to ask you all to thank the panel. And uh, if your question hasn't been answered, do come up to the front and ask it now before they escape. Thank you all very much. Thank you.